Hey friends, if you're in the market for a brand new wallet or sick of how overstuffed and bulky your old one is, then I've got some good news for you. Because today's episode is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. Ridge Wallets are like a cross between a wallet and a Swiss Army knife, despite being barely thicker than a smartphone case. The Ridge Wallet has room for up to 12 different cards, plus some spare cash. They come in over 30 different colors and they boast RFID blocking technology. But the thing I like the most is that they're so well put together that Ridge Wallet offers a lifetime warranty with every single product they sell. That means that if you look after it, your purchase of a Ridge Wallet could be the very last time you ever spend money on something to keep your cash and card safe. I also love how intuitive and sleek card extraction is, and it's little wonder that Ridge Wallets have received over 50,000 five-star reviews. That being said, if the wallet doesn't do it for you, you can get every penny of your money back if you return it within 45 days. Ridge Wallets is also offering you guys a 10% off discount on your orders if you go to ridge.com slash let's read and use promo code let's read. And with every dollar spent on the website before September 30th, you'll be entered into a prize drawing where the winner gets a brand new upgraded Ford Bronco or $75,000 cash. If those aren't reasons enough to make your new wallet a Ridge, I don't know what are. So you can head over to ridge.com slash let's read and enter that promo code let's read today. Now, without further ado, on with today's stories. I'll cut to the chase. I'm part of an extensive armed security for multiple private companies. Recently we got hired onto a construction security company in the Bay Area of Florida and I get told that I'm doing graveyard shifts from midnight to 0630. As the pay is higher and I'm normally up this late, that's fine with me. I pull up and the construction site is a private high school that's being renovated. Pretty uneventful stuff the first two weeks, except this one time when a trucker kept his walkie-talkie on while watching grown-up videos. That was pretty funny. On my third night shift on the third week with this company, one of the older guys told me that when I'd started, things could get hairy in the middle of the night. It's nothing new to me, but it definitely piqued my interest. My shift starts like any other shift. I show up and make sure my takedowns and hideaways are functioning. The dash cam is good to go and my laptop is plugged in. As I said, all standard and nothing abnormal. The officer that I'm relieving said some odd noises are coming from around the area. I nod and start patrolling the campus kind of expected either urban explorers or just some dumb kids, so wasn't really too hyper fixated on the situation. By about 0130, and I hear my first oddity. It sounds like screaming from the football field, and mind you, from the football field to all the way up on the right side of the campus is completely demolished with construction equipment and debris everywhere, like a giant maze of industrial equipment and building supplies. Due to the mess of their equipment, I stay put and pull out my night vision goggles to scan the field and the darkness beyond it. Ten minutes go by with nothing. No follow-up noises or anything. I have a whole area to cover within a time frame, so I pull out from my spot to finish my patrolling. I wrap up with the first patrol, log my time, and file a report for the oddity that happened. Afterwards, I pull back up to the front and park my unit off to the side under a garage wall that was protected on the entire right side. It's nearing about 0200, and so I mess around with some Pokemon Go and smoke a cigarette, then place some Age of Empires on Steam. I've got personal Wi-Fi in my car, so it enables me to slack off. Originally, I wasn't too bothered by the sound, but I soon couldn't shake off the feeling that if some dumb teen just got hurt on sight, things have the potential to get ugly quick. Nonetheless, I kept gaming. 0230 comes around and I get to the middle of the admin parking lot that is being built when I come across my first sign of trouble. So I'm driving with my left window down for noise purposes while other windows are CVPI tear tent. I feel confident no one or nothing can see inside my vehicle. As I pull up to the lot, I suddenly hear what sounds like a giant 2x4 hitting the side of the building with a force that is likened to Thor obliterating a planet. I black out and code one my way over to that area, 
before stopping mid-drive to listen for anyone. I hear what sounds like a bunch of sticks with rubber pads on the ends running through the cargo crates, and what followed that sound is a sound I will never forget. It sounded like a mixture between a lion and a coyote put into one, and at that moment, my blood went cold. I backed my unit up and called for LEOs to get to my site pronto, to which I then explained the situation to them, and the responder just replies, Oh God, it's back. As I'm panicking at their rather disturbing reaction, I hear the same running broomsticks and rubber pads sound again, but now from behind me. Then something I wish I'd never heard before. I heard the side door to the front building swing open and slam into the brick behind it. I peel out and code for lights and sirens to the main area of the building where the door is located. As I'm turning the corner with my lights and sirens, three city police officers are pulling in with their lights on as well. Two more city LEOs and a deputy pull into the back area of the school building and by this point, I'm almost soiling myself because this is something I've clearly never dealt with before. I draw my 45 ACP Taurus and turn my mag light on. I side peek the doorway and see nothing by dead darkness being cut through by the torch of a thousand suns as officers stack up behind me. Suddenly, we all hear the screech and then a bunch of destruction. Whoever was in here was absolutely decimating this one room. I get word from the other officers that were breaching, and we hit the room with speed and nearly pinpoint stillness. The room is completely trashed, seats ripped seemingly from the concrete and thrown several yards, wall bricks missing layers, doors cracked, however, nothing was found. We finish clearing the main building on high alert, following this trail of destruction. We're checking doors, rooms, and covering our backs the entire way down the hall. With nothing to actually be discovered, we all carefully start to hustle out towards the parking lot. I was the third to clear the building and come out onto the pavement and by now, it's almost 0430. Completely deadness outside. It was disturbing to go from such high energy to an area where it seemed to be completely dead silent. After it was all said and done, six officers saw the mess including myself, and all six and myself heard the different noises. We all still don't know what it is. I had a canine stationed with me until we both got off at 0630, and for the rest of the night, the canine would go nuts every 30 minutes or so, and we were constantly looking over our shoulders. Alright boys, it's my first time posting here and I don't know how to green text. This happened in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. It was 2015 and we were 12th graders going on a fall break from school. We decided to go hiking in the Kanbab Mountain, which is a protected area, but people are permitted to go hiking on a small designated hiking trail. It was a rather popular site too. It was our autumn break, so me and two friends just wanted to hang out and exercise a bit, and it was that really comfortable autumn weather too. A cloudy, kind of gloomy day, but not too cold and with little wind. There's a flat campsite with a couple of sunshades where people can rest and play around near the top. The hike there normally takes around an hour and a half to get there, which is where we decided to go. We brought food to eat and snuck in some alcohol because why not? Being a senior in high school does that to you, you know. Just stop caring because we were finished and we thought we knew it all. So around halfway through the hike, I saw what looked like an apartment building, about five or six stories tall, orange colored with its top floor windows reflecting light and all, just a normal building. I could only see the top bit above the tree line because tall pine trees are predominant here. The problem is that we have hiked there many times before and since and never came across such a thing. I was surprised and told one of my friends and sure enough he could see it too and described exactly what I saw. The third friend was behind us so a few minutes had passed and the building went out of sight. We waited for a bit and when he caught up we asked him, Did you see that building? Strange, isn't it? He just replied, No, what are you guys talking about? Me and my friend just thought maybe he didn't notice it and we continued onward until we arrived at the campsite about 30 minutes later. 
There were a bunch of people shouting and playing and having fun. As I said before, this place is popular on weekends. We wanted to get far from all the noise so we camped far out in some pretty thick woods with a little clearing and a felled tree so we could sit. We unpacked our stuff and started relaxing and smoking cigarettes. I took a picture of the clearing that we camped at, but getting a picture of the apartment building never crossed my mind until now. I know, the mind works in a weird if not frustrating way. Later on, I decided to take a bathroom break due to all the water and coffee I sipped on the way. And of course, the guys decided to do the same. We turned our backs from each other and spread out a few meters away. Our little potty circle allowed us to see all around us. I was just staring at a bunch of trees when suddenly the third friend who didn't see the building earlier just whispers loudly for us to shut up. We stopped making noise to figure out what was going on and then a bunch of branches started crackling and breaking far away and we heard a loud thud. I was of course still in the midst of taking a leak so I didn't turn to face the direction of that sound. Then my two friends started talking. Oh my god, did you see that? The other. Yeah. Wait, what was that thing? I quickly finished my business and asked them what was happening. They said that some sort of black thing just dropped from a tall tree in an instant. They said that thing must have been bigger than a fully grown horse. They further detailed the thing saying it was hairy and the thing ran four-legged into the woods disappearing almost instantly. We estimated it was about 30 to 40 meters away but weren't really sure of that since there were a couple of trees blocking full sight. I didn't see anything obviously but I did hear the noise. The next 30 minutes we finished our food and beers during which we talked about what it was and joked around. Maybe the Almas must have smelled our cans of fish and grew interested. Almas in Mongolian is like the Bigfoot of America or the Yeti of Tibet. Big furry ape-like creature with intelligence and cunning. A lot of tales and traditional folklore. So we decided to go back down of which there's two options. Go straight ahead, climb up some rocks and follow a trail into more woods or head back. And considering what we just experienced, we obviously chose the latter, safer option. While on the hike back, we talked about that thing non-stop, and me and another friend thought that it might have had something to do with the weird apartment building on the way up here. Finally, after another hour or so, we went down and into the city and headed home. Now, I've hiked there dozens of times since, but never came across anything like that again. I've even used Google Earth to eye spy for anything remotely built with concrete, but again, nothing came up. Logically, something that deep in the woods is impossible. A six-story apartment building, water pipes, and infrastructure built next to massive trees and in the mountains. I guess crazier things have happened, but it was just nice to get this off my chest. It's my first time posting here, but I have a spooky story to share about a time some friends and I went to Urbex in Vermont on a vacation. It was 2017, we were in college, and summer was approaching when my dorm mate suggested we go to Vermont. Some other people joined up and there was the suggestion of going out to Shaftesbury to hike, smoke, and hook up. I immediately think, oh hey, this is how horror movies start. We headed out there and started bumming around the state park, but nothing good really happened. We proceeded into town, which had very little going on outside the dinky motel we rented. Trying to find something to do, we talked with the clerk and let him know that we are sightseeing. He brought up Glastonbury, which was east of town and deep in the forest. He called it a modern ghost town, and with that being established, my roommate's friend immediately says, we're going. Next morning, we all wake up at the crack of dawn and head towards the forest of Glastonbury. On the way to the trail, a friend on his phone says that this area is in the Bennington Triangle and that it was apparently well known for a series of disappearances in the area. We all laugh, but honestly we got a bit worked up. Why would the clerk suggest tourists go to such a controversial area? We approached a trailhead near where the village was, park and talk with some other hikers that were nearby. They all laugh and say that they've never seen a ghost town in the woods, or even the foundations supposedly left behind, so either they just haven't explored deep enough or were being set up for something. And like any college students in a horror movie, 
we decide to hike anyways. We all head out, following the map that we'd printed out at a motel from some website, following the Glastonbury Loop as my roommate's one friend is using her phone as GPS as we hike. The hike itself sucks. It's all uphill somehow in the Glastonbury wilderness, but we think to ourselves, how bad can it be? We're near a college town. We can simply turn back and head into town if this turns uneventful. The heat that day was bad. There were bugs everywhere and their insistent buzzing was driving us nuts. After like four hours or so, we discovered this little abandoned cabin that was rotting in the woods. It was small, with only one room, a rusted out stove and some broken glass everywhere. Seeing as it was the only event to actually spark interest with us, we break inside where we find a bunch of bones scattered across the floor. One of my roommate's friends mentions that it was probably from coyotes or bobcats. Now that we have the idea of a bobcat nearby, we're all a little spooked as we go back to following the trail. We approach a sign in the middle of the woods, one of those national park ones that say, you are here, and we decide to take the detour from the map that we had and start following a river further uphill. The hike takes another hour until we reach the forks, which is the outskirts of the town. One of the friends begins to hear noises in the woods, like people following us, but we brush it off and figure that it's just more hikers. We continue up the river. Everywhere is covered and overgrown by trees, and there's nothing really to see but rubble. We hear more movement in the distance, but we continue to brush it off that it's summer, so we think it could be other hikers. The six of us keep marching up the hill, spotting different abandoned buildings as we progress. One of them ends up getting way ahead of us and shouts out from about 50 yards deeper up the mountain. They say that the path has appeared, made of crushed up white rocks everywhere, and that it's deep in the brush. We all laugh and decide that this is the best place to continue on, but one friend gets upset and doesn't want to continue forward. We all march up the path and eventually find piles of rocks everywhere, like rocky mounds covered in moss, as my roommate starts shouting out telling the people walking around us to join us, or maybe they were shouting to try and scare animals away. The upset friend from earlier suddenly outright refuses to continue, and so we all agree to head back as the adventure was losing its thrill and we begin our trek back. That's when things got weird. As we head back toward the ghost town, the path we follow continues and we never find the town. We begin to wonder if we missed a turn that would have brought us back to familiar areas and as the hike back continues on, we start to get worried as it's now around 3pm. It would take a few more hours to get back to the car, meaning we are now racing against sundown. We trek deeper and deeper, but we realize now that we're lost. No one can find the river near the ghost town that we specifically followed uphill. Another hour of hiking goes by and the sun is starting to get low through the trees. A few friends start yelling for help hoping that all those walking noises that we were hearing are people who can help. The upset friend is getting angry now and running off ahead to figure out if we're done for or not. Their words. She vanishes for about half an hour, and we're really worried now, and of course, some idiot brings up the Blair Witch myth. Almost instantly, like magic, we hear the missing friend yell that she found something. We follow her voice and find an old three-story house surrounded by dead trees, causing us all to quite literally lose our minds. She mentions that she hadn't been inside and the door is locked. But now, the trees have consumed a lot of sunlight, so there's barely any more hiking that could be done. We look around one last time and despite the ghost town somehow being completely consumed by the forest, this random house is completely intact. Still weathered down, but in okay condition. Even the windows aren't broken. There's a debate on whether to go into the house, and I vote yes in case there's an old phone or a map. Roommate is understandably very against the idea, but the vote goes 4-2, to two, so we work our way in by managing to get the back door of the house open. The two who were against remain outside. Once inside, we realize we're in a kitchen as there's a huge fireplace with a blackened hearth, we hear a giant crash in the distance, like a tree limb falling, and we call out to my roommate and the other friend who stayed outside. They rush inside, stating that the walking we heard earlier was really close now. Taking no chances, we do a quick search through the house, and of course there's no phone and nothing that resembles a map. 
Suddenly, one of the friends that were against entering the house shouts that he got a signal. It lasted just long enough for him to find our location on Google and screenshot the map, and that's when we discovered that if we head west, towards the setting sun, that there would be a highway there. We instantly leave the house and head off towards the sunlight. Hours go by, and eventually we happen upon some actual other hikers, not just footsteps this time. We learn that we're rather close to Manchester Center, a town about 20 miles north of where we were parked. The couple who found us gives us water, as some other hikers volunteer to take us back to our SUV. The entire time we couldn't stop thanking them, and who knew I would have fallen in love with seeing our dumb little SUV again. We immediately drove back to Albany and everyone was quiet on the ride back, rather napping or trying to process how close we were to possibly losing our lives. It eventually became a good party story about the time we got lost in the woods and found the Blair Witch House, and how we got out before we found one of us standing in the corner. However, jokes and story aside, to this day, I'm not sure what happened. I've seen YouTube videos of people going to the ghost town, but the house we went into is never talked about and I'm not sure if it was a witch's house or someone's hunting cabin. Was it simply all just one giant coincidence? Or was there something deeper at work here that didn't want us to investigate any further into the house? Either way, I have no interest in going back. I live with my father in a place with hundreds of houses, a majority of them more or less abandoned. I had lived here since I was a kid, so about 15 years. When I was a kid, I guess around 5 years old, there was a man living in the house right across my father's house. His first name starts with P, so let's just refer to him as that. Anyway, P was in his late 70s. He was a retired war veteran and he was very good with herbs and botanics and other odd things. He was also a junk collector, not a hoarder, just a unique antique collector, and because of it, he did have a lot of weird stuff, like dozens of ceramic trolls outside his front door and stuff like that. He also had the biggest apples in his apple tree. Rumors said P used his feces as fertilizer, but that's probably not true. Probably. However, P barely spoke to anyone. People didn't really know much about him either, but my father was an exception. Since he is good with people and whatnot, he managed to chat up small talk with P every once in a while. He always told me to stay away from him, though. Years passed, and P died when I was around 11 years old. My father told me about it the same day. A couple of days later, P's mother and sister came here to clean out the house and pick up what was theirs. P's mother was really old, as you may have already have realized, which made it harder for them to clean it out, and they didn't feel like doing it. On top of that... They were naturally sad about P's death. With all of this combined, they offered my father to buy P's property for a small amount of money, as they just wanted to get it over with. And so, my father did buy P's property, including all of the stuff inside his house. He would then spend weeks cleaning that stuff up, and man, all the weird things he found in there. One of the things he found inside P's house was an electric scooter, the two-wheeled kind. Kids sometimes have them which he just carried and put in our storage room. After he cleaned the house, he spent some time applying new wallpapers and placed a new floor to freshen up a little. He then gave me the house to use instead of a room. Yes, you read that right. I've had my own house before I was even an adult. It's only two rooms though, and right in front of my father's place. Now the following weeks, mysterious things started happening around here. Things would seem out of place, and strange sounds could be heard at night. My father jokingly said that it was P's ghosts, and it made me rather uncomfortable at times, but I manned up and just didn't think about it that way. Some nights when I went out to take a leak in the bushes, I could feel as if P was watching me from somewhere. I don't know how to describe this feeling more than I could just feel it. Months later, my father went on a month-long boat trip and I stayed at my mother's house during that time since I didn't want to go with him. A couple of weeks into his vacation, another neighbor called my father and told him our fire alarm went off. My father told him where the extra set of keys were and our neighbor went inside to find nothing out of the ordinary. 
When my father came home from his vacation, he went to turn the water back on and the electricity, and then he opened the storage room. Inside was the electrical scooter with a completely burned out tire and a huge hole in the fat carpet on the floor. This was extremely weird, since the scooter can't possibly be started without the key in the ignition. The scooter hadn't even been test driven since he removed it from P's house, and this is when my father really thought something was going on about P. He told me, and I freaked a little, but it didn't stop me from sleeping in my new house though. Various small spooky things continued to happen and both my father and I were convinced that P's ghost was messing with us. We looked through all of his old stuff again to see what kinds of things we could find if we took a second look and my father found a small sign with P. Wicked on it. Wicked was P's surname. My father decided to take the sign and attach it to the house as a sign of respect of some sort or just to honor the old man. He did so and immediately after that, the haunting and tormenting seemed to stop. None of us got that feeling anymore. I didn't feel creeped on when taking a leak in the bushes outside my house. I guess it's nothing too crazy, but I just felt like I wanted to share this with you, X. I didn't get to know Wicked, but I can't help but think that he was just misunderstood and simply wanted to collect antiques, and the entire neighborhood just decided to title him as some creep. I've been a long time lurker on this board and I figured that I would post some of my unsettling if not just outright strange experiences from my childhood. It was 2009-ish and I was living in an old duplex with my mom, my mom's girlfriend who we'll call Kim and Kim's daughter who we'll call Talia. The house itself was built in 1947 so it's seen its fair amount of families come and go. We were friends with our neighbors, a single mom with two sons who were around my age. When we first moved in, there were these small pouches of scented herbs hanging from all the windows. My moms tell me to not move them when I reach for them, but I eventually take down the herbs that were hanging in my room. I mean, it was my room, I didn't want them in there. So we find pennies in almost every corner of the house. Just four pennies per corner, all heads up and arranged in a square. And they were placed in every reachable corner of all the rooms. Again, mom tells me not to touch them and again, I pretty quickly pick up the ones in my room. She would never tell me what they were, so I never understood their existence or why they were there. The house also had a wildly overgrown backyard. The yard itself was tiny, maybe only 30 by 15 feet, but it had tons of colorful plants that were completely untended to. Our non-adjoined neighbor had this huge wooden privacy fence that made our yard seem even smaller and because of it, the plants began growing vertically along it. Quite beautiful, if I'm being honest, like a wall of flora. The house had this steep spiral staircase in the middle of the second floor hallway that led up to a split attic. One side had my mom's exercise equipment while the other had some junk for us kids, boxes of toys and old video games, stuff like that. The second floor itself was just for bedrooms and a bathroom. The master bedroom looked down the hallway where the first door on the left was Talia's room, then the door to the spiral staircase, then my room, and finally the bathroom which faced back at the master bedroom. My mom and Kim would claim that they'd see me sleepwalk out of Talia's room, down the hallway, into my room and then a few moments later, back out of Talia's room, like I was stuck in a loop or something. They couldn't wake me up and they're both pretty small while I'm in the middle of male puberty so they couldn't exactly restrain me either. They devised a plan where they just had to wait in front of my mattress for me to walk by and when I would, they both just pushed me over into bed. Apparently it worked a couple of times before deciding to put my dresser in front of the archway and hung a curtain for privacy's sake. Before getting to this house, I had never been known to sleepwalk and I haven't done it since moving out. We had two dogs, a bulldog and a beagle. The beagle was my shadow and I loved her more than anything. She goes to bed with me every night, usually sleeping at the foot of the bed. I'd wake up periodically to her growling at the corner of the room with her hackles raised. She would still be laying down in bed but was clearly agitated by something. The corner she'd stare at is right behind the door and if the door were to be open, 
she'd be staring at the closet corner to the attic staircase. I obviously can't ever see anything in the corner as it's too dark, but I reach down and pat her to try and calm her and myself down, and she looks back at me, eyes wide, licking her chops, but when she looks back at the corner, she kind of just glances around the room like she lost whatever she was looking at and settles back down. This would become a weekly occurrence over our two years of living there. I would sometimes wake up from naps or in the middle of the night to the sound of my name being whispered really loudly, similar to a stage whisper. It didn't sound like my mom or Kim or anyone in the house. The voice was usually masculine, but the oldest guy in the building was only a couple of years older than me. Besides, my bed was against the outside wall, not the one we shared with the neighbors so it wasn't coming from my neighboring rooms. So one night, I'm up way past my bedtime playing Pokemon on my DS. I always played with a sound off, and I still do, but I was feeling goofy, so I took the volume slider on the side of the DS and cranked it up and back down a couple of times, making the music play for a second then stop, then play for a second then stop. I did this once or twice before realizing that blasting Pokemon music was a surefire way to get busted for staying up late. A few moments go by. I'm battling a gym leader or something and I distinctly hear the music come in and out again. I didn't touch the volume slider as my finger was actually on it, forcing it to remain off. It didn't sound like the actual game's audio either, but more like someone had recorded the exact sound that came from my DS and played it back to me. Feeling confused and scared, I just shut the DS down and fell asleep, hugging my dog. So about the attic, I always had a sinking feeling when climbing the steps that led to the attic. I would normally try to ignore it so I didn't come off like a coward in front of everyone. I would occasionally go up there to play a game or something with Talia, but no matter how confident I acted, I always had the most horrific feeling of being watched the entire time. Even being with an entire family wouldn't make the feeling go away. One day, Talia and I built a small box fort in the attic. Again, I wouldn't tell anyone that I was afraid of the attic. Teenage masculinity, I guess. Talia ended up leaving something in the box fort and wanted it back, and after pestering her, she drops the bombshell that she doesn't want to go up there by herself because the attic scares her. I remember wanting to tell her that I agree, that the attic feels almost evil in a sense, but instead, I go up to grab it. Without missing a beat, the feeling of dread returns the moment I'm on the first step, and only grows worse as I climb up and get to the attic proper. I get to the fort and try to reach into the box to grab her toy, but my arms aren't long enough, so I get on my stomach and crawl through. For some reason, the second I got inside, the feeling of dread amps up to 11, and still to this day, I never felt this again. All the hair on my body stood on end and my eyes started watering and I felt myself entering that survival panic mode. I snatched the toy and ripped myself out of the box, splitting it open in the process but I didn't even care anymore because I swear I saw something duck out of my vision as I ran out of there. We spent one whole winter all just sleeping in the downstairs living room. We have a huge sectional couch and they would blow up an air mattress right next to it so it was like one giant bed. I thought it was just fun, like camping out in the living room. It wasn't until much later that my mom would tell me that both her and Kim were terrified of the house and just wanted us all together at night. She told me that the pennies and pouches were to ward off spirits and so that would explain why I was getting affected the most. I was the only one who destroyed and interrupted the wards in my room. Anyway, that's about it for my experience in the house. Kim also claimed to have seen a woman in gardening clothes in the backyard from the upstairs bathroom and ran down to see who was in the yard, only for no one to be there. She also claimed to have had a hand come out of a cabinet and grab her leg while she was putting dishes away, and it only let go when she screamed at it. She said that she would often smell onions, like a man's body odor. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I've been wondering how to put this down since this afternoon and decided all the information would need to be listed. I'm sorry if there's any unnecessary rambling, but I want any readers to have as full a picture as possible. 
I'm open-minded and not easily freaked out, but since yesterday, I've had four experiences that I just can't seem to explain. At approximately 9.15am yesterday, I was in my car, in my driveway, loading my mobile studio ready to go do a shoot. I'm a freelance photographer. My neighbor, who lives across the street from me, reversed his car into the road, rolled down his window and called to me. Hey, how are you? I replied. I'm good, mate. To which he gave me a thumbs up and drove away. I returned to my home, lifted another bag of equipment, returned my car and put it in the back door. It took maybe a maximum of 30 seconds to get this bag and return to the car. As I did so, I looked across the road to see my neighbor repeating the exact same maneuver as before. He reversed his car into the road, rolled down his window, and even gave me the same greeting of, Hey, how are you? I replied exactly as before, which he, again, gave me a thumbs up and drove away. It never crossed my mind to say that I heard him earlier and that I even replied to him, and overall felt the situation to be quite surreal. The morning went by and I finished the shoot and was home by 1pm. My wife was out so I made coffee and went to the computer room to have a look at the photographs that I'd taken. I placed the mini SD card in the card reader and waited till the raw files had loaded onto my computer. A quick glance over the files already led me to affirm that six or seven of them needed to be deleted due to wrong exposure and so I duly deleted them. At that moment my wife came in and I greeted her with Hey, how was your morning? She replied, Okay, yours. And then asked if I could make her a coffee and leave it on the kitchen table. She began to put her shopping away and I came back to the computer only to see the files still showing on the card. Not wanting to risk losing them, I decided to get the USB cable and link the camera directly to the computer. I then downloaded the photographs to a directory called Work in Progress. My workflow is obviously really important to me. Now things started to get really weird. As I'm sitting at the computer, my wife comes in the front door and greets me. Hey, I didn't expect to see you so soon. You could have picked me up with these heavy bags if I'd known. I said yeah, sorry, and told her that her coffee was on the table, to which she said, Oh, awesome. You know me so well. But then, her coffee wasn't there. She came over and teased me for hyping up the coffee, and I just sat there dumbfounded. I didn't drink the coffee. I don't even like coffee. She noticed how disturbing and perplexed I was, and so a discussion followed that led me to believe that either I'm needing some medication, or time is repeating itself. I know, it's ridiculous, and even saying that line makes me cringe, but my wife explained that she had only come in once and laughingly suggested that I was working way too hard. Example 3. I've had a bad head cold for a few days and I'm not sleeping too well. At 3.20am this morning, I got up to use the toilet, making sure to keep as quiet as possible as my son starts work early and wakes up at 4.15am. I returned to bed, I was getting back under the covers when my wife woke up, looked at the digital clock and said, Go make sure T's up for work. I don't hear him so he might have slept in. I look at the clock and it was 3.55. Now. I know I'm getting older, but I don't need 35 minutes to go pee, and I know for a fact that it was 3.20 when I went to the toilet. As for the last example, I have two dogs, both cocker spaniels, and one of them has developed some kind of psychological fear of me since yesterday morning. If I go into the living room, she paces around the outside of the room and won't come to me. If I leave the door open, she'll pace the room, then run into the kitchen. My wife thinks that I stood on her tail or might have accidentally kicked her in my sleep. But she's an old dog. This attitude shouldn't have drastically developed within 24 hours. Something's happening, X. Either to me or around me. I've experienced my own reality glitch. Or I guess you could call it a time warp. Several years ago, I was visiting my parents who live over an hour and a half away from me. The time was 9.12pm when I'd started the car and proceeded to go home. I had a very strange feeling as I passed under an overpass that was about 10 minutes away from my parents. I remember listening to the radio and everything felt very still. Even the air felt kind of stale. My passengers were sleeping, so I was alone. 
I remember that the street lights along the freeway were passing so fast. I know that I'm not speeding because of having seen several police officers on the trip there, so I was extra careful about my driving. All of a sudden, I was pulling down my driveway and the time was only 9.28. I called my mom and dad from my home phone to let them know that we made it home safe. It's a family thing, worrying. My dad answered the phone and was completely shocked that it was home. He thought it was some kind of joke. My normal 90-minute trip somehow turned into a 16-minute trip, and he and I still talk about it and I wish I could explain it. At least I have someone else to discuss the experience with and that I can talk to. Me and my friend Keisha used to walk down to Burgess Park in the evening with our kids to feed the ducks. Quite often it was dark and the gates to that part of the park were locked, but there was a gap in the railings to squeeze through, so we used to do this regularly. The kids enjoyed it and it was a nice walk and could still walk through the rest of Burgess. It's massive and mostly not gated off. Well, one night after we fed some ducks, we came out and just saw over the hilltop in the ungated section a red and white striped top of a circus tent. Or at least, it's what we presumed. All the children saw it too, so we said the next day that we would inquire about tickets and prices. But since it was so late that night, we didn't want to head over. We did think it was odd, however, as there were no posters advertising any circus or carnival. We went home and the next day we went to find out about the circus. There was no tent. No evidence in the grass to suggest that there had been a tent of any kind, and we even asked the park keeper on shift and he said that there was no circus that had been around recently. He said one did come yearly but not recently and it always leaves such a mess behind that there's no way the cleanup was over in 12 hours. There was nothing on the grass to show anything had been there and we were totally baffled by what it was. This story happened about six months ago. Me and my daughter were up way past our bedtime, and it was probably about 2 a.m. I was on the internet on the laptop when suddenly the connection went off along with the Sky TV. My internet was through the Sky connection, so I began checking the leads and connections and found that the plug had disappeared, as in there should have been five plugs total. I counted them all, and yet one was gone. I asked my daughter to check too and we unplugged everything and one by one reconnected everything and to no avail. One plug was just missing. I was extremely frightened as my brain refused to accept the strange reality of this but since my daughter is only 11, I tried to be as calm so as not to scare her. Oh well, hey it's very late, let's go to bed. I said and I disconnected everything again. The next morning I got up and rushed down to check the plugs and, wouldn't you know it, there were five plugs again. Each individual one worked fine when I reconnected them. But my daughter and I counted them and put our entire attention onto it too. This wasn't like a lazy miscount at 2am. My dad told me about his nephew's experience a few good years ago and they were about to go on holidays so my cousin went back in the house to check that everything was switched off and to double check. He put his car keys on the kitchen counter and when he turned to pick them up, they were gone. They searched everywhere and still there were no keys to be found. He was so bemused by it all that he regressed a short while after. His mentality practically collapsed within itself and in regression, he remembered putting the keys down and then remembering that they were gone. But in between those moments, there is no memory at all for him. Nothing. Those few seconds, if not minutes, of his life are just gone. No, the keys never did turn up, and they still live in that house to this day. Ryan Schertz has been trying to save John Jones for 19 hours already that fateful day in 2010. John had gotten himself trapped head first and upside down in a narrow passageway in Utah's Nutty Putty Cave, and Ryan and his team were doing everything they could to get him out. While his men built a pulley system meant to yank John out, Ryan stayed with him, talking to keep him calm. I'm sorry I'm so fat, John said. It would be so much easier for you guys to get me out of here if I wasn't so fat. Ryan promised that he'd be his workout buddy when they got out. For now, the pulley was in place, 
and they were going to start pulling. John needed to get ready. When they yanked him up, John shrieked in pain. They gave him a break. Ryan talked him through it and they pulled again. This time, though, things got worse. A natural arch through which the rope was fed shattered and the rope broke. A metal carabiner fell and hit Ryan in the face, causing him to bite his tongue in half. John fell back down the hole. Ryan had to get out. While blood dribbled out of his mouth, he promised John that he'd be back for him. Ryan's team helped him escape the collapsing cave, and Ryan's father went in to take over for him. We're going to get you out, he told the man trapped inside. But John was already unconscious, and he would never wake up again. Kentuckian Floyd Collins found Crystal Cave in 1917, and he was determined to explore every inch of it. For eight years, he squeezed through its passageways until the day he got trapped. His lantern had started to flicker and Collins was trying to get out before he lost light. He was climbing his way up a tight passageway when he knocked a 12 kilogram or 27 pound rock loose. It came crashing down onto his ankle, pinning him in place. For the next 17 days, rescue teams tried to save him, but nothing they tried worked. In time, they brought in miners to dig a shaft to him, believing the only hope was to make a new way out. While he waited, Collins was becoming a celebrity. Tourists from all around were coming to see his rescue, with hucksters setting up booths to sell food, drinks, and souvenirs. The mine shaft took too long, and on his 18th day in the cave, Collins succumbed to hypothermia, thirst, and hunger. The group of 17 students who visited New Zealand's Cave Creek in 1995 didn't think that they were doing anything dangerous. They weren't exploring narrow pathways. They were on a guided tour, staying on a beaten path designed for tourists. When they made it to a platform that overlooked a chasm, some of the boys couldn't help but notice how flimsy it felt. As a joke, they jumped and shook it, marveling at how precariously it seemed to be built. They figured it was all in fun. In an era of safety regulations, they assumed that it just looked flimsier than it really was. But they were wrong. The platform had been built by men with no experience in engineering. It was meant to be bolted in place, but they'd use nails instead simply because they didn't have a drill handy. Under the weight of the students, the platform gave way. It toppled over and collapsed, crashing down into the chasm below. One student survived by grabbing onto the handrail and riding it down, but his classmates were hurled overboard and killed. Of the 17, only four survived. They were lifted out in helicopters. One had a fractured spine, but with 13 of her friends dead, she counted herself as one of the lucky ones. In 1988, Andrew White was on a team of 15 people exploring one of the deepest caves in the world. They would never see the bottom. A freak storm hit. A flood of water poured in through the cave entrance and the middle section of the entire cave collapsed. All 15 people were trapped underground with White and a few others stuck on a small ledge. It was hard to know what to do. The roof above them was getting ready to collapse, but the rushing water below them was too wild to enter. Boulders would fall off the cave walls and into the water, threatening to crush anyone who dared to step in. White decided to try it. He swam through the water and managed to find another way out. Over the next 27 hours, he and others worked to send in line and lead his team out. Kai Kankanen was one of the last divers to go into Norway's Plura Cave. It was a cold winter day in February 2014, and the pond that led to the cave had frozen over. The divers had to cut a hole in the ice before diving in. Patrick Gonquist and Yari Hunteren went in first and Kai's group followed after. The plan was to swim through the pathways of Plura and come out on the other side where there was an exit in the mountainside. Kai had already made it most of the way when he found Hulteren's body. His friend had gotten trapped in a narrow passageway. In his panic, he swallowed water and choked. Now, Yari's lifeless body was blocking the way forward. Yari Usamaki, one of the men with Kai, panicked. He started breathing too quickly and poisoned himself with carbon dioxide. Kai tried to save him, but he couldn't get him to calm down. 
and Yari was the next to die, and Kai was left alone. Kai turned back. He swam through the freezing water and back to the pond, but he wouldn't find the hold they'd made. He had no choice to smash his way through the ice blocking his way to the surface. By the time he was out, Kai had been underwater for 11 hours. The other men in his group had made it to the other exit and survived, and would take nearly two months though for the bodies of their friends to be retrieved. When my wife and I were quite a bit younger, we decided that we would spend the bicentennial outdoors. Yes, July of 76, we're old. We lived in Pueblo at the time and decided to go hiking, fishing, and camp along Lime Creek between Durango and Silverton. There wasn't anything other than brookies in the creek, but they were plentiful and fun to catch. We left our car by the side of the road along Old Lime Creek Road about five miles in from the highway and packed in upstream along the creek with our shepherd, Rebel. It only took about an hour to get to where we wanted to camp, a nice meadow between the creek just before a slot canyon that required you to go swim to get any further upstream, either that or take a several mile detour. We camped uneventfully that night, the 3rd of July, enjoying the sounds of the rippling creek and nature all around us. It was such a nice night that we just slept out under the stars and didn't bother to pitch our little backpacking tent. A little cool, but we had the fire going and our lightweight 30 degree bag, so we were very comfortable. The next day we had breakfast, packed up, and we all swam our way up the creek to the next wide spot with a bit of bank in the canyon, only about 150 yards or so. Now Rebel was never one to turn down a chance to get wet, but we had to do quite a bit of coaxing to get him to follow us up the creek. We fished and splashed upstream a bit, and before we knew it, it was lunchtime. We thought that we'd fry up some of those brookies, but we were in the slot canyon that terminated in a fairly deep pool with about a ten-foot rocky waterfall at the end of it. We decided that I would scale the waterfall and pull the dog and the packs up, and then I'd help Maggie get up. It was fairly difficult, even with the help of an old cable left over from a mining operation that was hanging down the sidewall of the canyon. It took a lot of effort and thought that we finally made it. We looked back down that waterfall and wondered what the heck we were thinking. Rebel was none too happy about it either and seemed to get more irritable by the minute. We found enough driftwood at the rocky top of the falls to get a fire started and get the fish fried up and that was about it. You know that uneasy feeling that several others have mentioned? It was like a switch turned on and we all of a sudden became aware of our surroundings. It grew like a cancer, and I actually watched the hair on the back of Rebel's neck stand up. Maggie felt it too, and we both noticed that it was getting dark fast down in this canyon. First thought in my head was a cat, and I actually felt a bit better about that because I figured the cat would leave us be between the fire and the dog. I told Maggie what I thought, and she seemed to feel a bit better too. I did not want to get caught in the dark in the canyon for a bunch of reasons, flash floods, etc., I spied what looked like a mine shaft about 200 feet above us, a heck of a steep climb, but it looked like our best bet. We pulled out our flashlights, and by the time we reached it, it was pitch black. The dog was a mess by this point, whipping around in circles, whining, yelping, and generally being a real pain in the backside. Maggie and I were drenched with sweat and immediately began to freeze. July in the mountains is a weird thing. I have seen blizzard conditions before, but... This was like someone turned on the deep freeze. We were at what looked like the start of a mine. It only went back about 10 feet, but there was evidence of fires at the mouth, and they curiously looked fresh. I was too tired to think more about it. I knew that we had to get out of our wet clothes, pitch the tent, and climb in our bags before we got serious hypothermia. That was no fun, let me tell you. Having to do all of that by the light of our rapidly dying flashlight and there was no firewood anywhere close. I cursed myself several times for letting things get this far out of control. We finally got the tent pitched right there in the back of this little cave, buck naked as we had no dry clothes left. The sleeping bags were slightly damp too, even though we had stuffed them in plastic garbage bags before our swimming expedition up the canyon. And we froze. It was miserable. 
About one in the morning, I called Rebel into the tent for a little heat. The dogs seemed to have calmed down greatly, and with the added heat, we drifted off. Sometime during the night, I heard something that just about woke me. I was still in a haze, so I fell asleep again immediately. I woke up one more time because I thought that I heard Rebel yip a little bit, but again, I was in and out. I pulled my hand out to pet his head and he licked my hand and I fell asleep again. Maggie later said that she fell asleep the same time as I did but never woke up at all during the night. I woke to the most horrible noise that I'd ever heard coming out of a hundred pound woman. Just the most god awful shrieks that I'd ever heard and I never want to hear that again. I opened my eyes just in time to see a man at the mouth of the shaft silhouetted against the morning daylight looking back at us with the most twisted, evil grin I had ever seen on the face of another human. I scrambled to get free of the tightly zipped bag in the little tent while he just crouched there and grinned. When I was just about free, he disappeared. Now, we were granola crunch and tree hug and anti-gun nature freaks at the time, so the only thing I had of any consequence as a weapon was my camp knife. I found it after what seemed like hours of searching, but really was probably under a minute. I very cautiously made my way to the entrance, millimeters at a time. The guy was gone. About that time, Maggie started screaming and whimpering again, so I rushed back to the back of the shaft. She had struggled out of the tent and was pointing at what used to be Rebel. His head was nearly severed, and the tent and the bags were ruined with blood all over everything. She had blood all over her, so the first thing I did was make sure that she wasn't injured. Then I checked myself. We were okay. It was all Rebel's blood. We put on our still damp, cold clothes from the night before, and then we noticed that our boots were gone. We were in trouble. I had some paracord, so we tied some shirts and towels around our feet and climbed back down towards the creek. We left everything in the mine except for the knife and some stuff that we shoved in our pockets. It took us eight hours to get back down to the car and we looked like raw hamburger meat. Hands, feet, arms, legs scraped raw, bruised and bleeding. We jumped in. The car started right up thankfully and we left a dust cloud that blanketed the valley as we sped down the rough trail toward Durango. We limped into the sheriff's office and we looked absolutely tragic. We got our story out. My wife threw tears and me talking way too fast but finally got it all out. The deputies said that they would go out first thing in the morning and asked us to stay in town. We had no money for a hotel so they let us stay in a cell after we showered and changed into prison jumpsuits. We were there at the jail waiting when the expedition returned with the convoy of three trucks. I noticed that all the officers who were quite wet and filthy gave us dirty looks as they passed us and the deputy that we had talked to the day before herded us back to his office, and then came the interrogation. It turns out that some animal had spread the dog's remains all down the side of the creek, and he said that there was nothing else there. No tent, no backpacks, nothing. He asked us if we had any drugs. I didn't want to admit to him that we had some herb, so I denied it. It was clear that we were fighting a losing battle, they had come to the conclusion that we were wandering out in the woods high on LSD while a mountain lion had gotten our dog. The idiot even made us change back into our filthy clothes and give back the jumpsuits right then. He told us that he better never see us again. And we left. Maggie was sobbing, and I'd never been back to Durango. The thing that I still have nightmares about years later, and I've never mentioned this to Maggie, is the second time when I woke up when I heard Rebel yelp. Was that when he died? And if it was, was it the dog who licked my hand before I fell back asleep? I still go out into the wilderness, never overnight, out well before dark, and only with other people and always with a big gun. I respect animals, but I fear people. A few years ago, while in college, I was really into weird, internet-obscure content. Back when ARGs and creepypastas weren't cliché YouTube bait, but rather dark and mysterious and sometimes downright disturbing. 
I found one of those mini ARG sites where you complete a bunch of obscure complex riddles and puzzles to advance onto new levels. Now I don't remember its name, but the whole theme of the site was rather dark. I would spend many hours trying to solve the puzzles. I mean, I would take notes and study them, even in class, eagerly waiting to get back to my computer and keep playing. This one particular level took me an embarrassing amount of time to complete, and one day, all of a sudden, I felt extremely ill in class as I was reading my ARG notes for the new level. I don't mean just an upset stomach, I'm talking severe anxiety, dizziness, and vertigo. It didn't last long though, but it felt miserable, and the anxiety ended up instilling this feeling of dread inside of me. I was confused and scared, and with all the evidence I had at the time, I blamed the game. I genuinely felt like it was driving me crazy. Not just an addiction either. I'd get resentful for playing the game because I knew that I was snared in it, but I'd get even angrier and feel even worse when I wouldn't play the game, because the game was all I thought about. I'm not superstitious. I didn't believe that the ARG had some kind of paranormal impact on me, or that there was some sort of ghost in the machine, but I did consider the fact that it could be making me paranoid and obsessed, so I gave it up. I never tried playing it again as I finally realized that I was extremely scared of it, almost like I developed Stockholm Syndrome to the game. The fear and anger would go away if I just kept playing. I wiped it from my internet history, installed extensions that prevented me from opening the website, and I even had my roommate sign into Firefox and put a password on his account so I wouldn't be able to remove any extensions. But the anxiety never went away though, and still to this day it gets progressively worse. Depression, panic attacks, and new random phobias, like being scared of holes and being scared of commitment. However, I normally brushed it off as most likely a coincidence as I always felt a little depressed, shy, and stressed, but who knows. Sometime after I gave up on the ARG, my roommate noticed my symptoms and suggested I get checked on. And long story short, I got diagnosed with a terminal neurological disease. Said disease can in fact create or amplify depression and anxiety. I know, it all sounds like a big coincidence. I'm not convinced of the opposite, I just wanted to mention this story. Ironic thing is that I've almost completely forgotten everything about that ARG, like my conscience has blocked it out completely. I don't remember the name of the game, how it looked, what the puzzles were about or anything else, but I'm sure it existed. Hell, if I were to find my old college notebooks, then perhaps I can find the ARG notes that I wrote among them. But maybe that's a door that best remains shut. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, holes and commitment don't mix.